Awesome. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sierra Bragan. I am the owner and founder of Miami Mom Collective. We are Miami's premier parenting resource. Our aim, our goal is to encourage, equip, and empower local moms with relevant resources and a meaningful community. So if you've joined us for any of these webinars in the past, you've heard me say every time that this series has truly been so encouraging, not only for me personally, but I believe for moms who are in our community who have been able to join. Um, we love linking arms with You Health Jackson Children's Care to bring these great resources to you. So it is just my honor and joy to be your host tonight. I'm super excited. Um, we have a great panel tonight and we're talking about, like I said, a very important topic, COVID and anxiety. Um, I think if we're honest, we've probably all at some point in the last 100 months that we've been <laughs> beyond lockdown or quarantined or walking through this, I think we've all probably had a moment of anxiety or fear or frustration or how do I cope and deal. So I'm super excited to have some amazing experts with us tonight who are going to help us navigate and walk through um, a couple of housekeeping things. Again, use that um, chat feature. We love seeing you guys chat and engage with one another and with our panel. Um, also, the Q&A box is particularly for a question. So if you have a question, please put that in the Q&A box and we will do our very best to get to all of those, but that'll help us keep the questions separate from the, the chit chat, but we love the chit chat. Um, so y'all engage together there and then let us know, um, you know, if you have a particular question and we will, we will do our very best to get to those. So we've got a wonderful panel tonight. I wanna take a minute to, um, to introduce them to you. So in just a little while, you're gonna hear from, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce um, Yanier Rodriguez. He is a parent facilitator with the Children's Trust Parent Club. Yanni, we love the Parent Club. <laughs> we have moms in our community who have been a part of what you guys are doing and um, you're truly doing great things. And so we're super excited to share more about that with the audience tonight. But Yanier has completed his Master's of Science in Counseling Psychology at FIU. Mm -hmm. So he's a parent facilitator for the Children's Stress Parent Club. And he's really excited just to help parents learn new strategies. I'm a parent of two, almost three, the third one's coming soon, and I'm always looking and needing new strategies, new techniques. How can I raise strong, confident, independent children? So I know you're going to have some great things to share with us tonight, and um, which leads me also to introduce your associate, Lucia Greco, who is um, also a parent facilitator. She's a registered clinical social work intern from the Center for Children and Families at FIU. So um, I know that she has a heart of working with parents and children to help them find their strengths. And we all know that if we can help extract, I always say extract the treasure is kind of my, my thing, but if we can find the strengths of our children, help extract that, we're gonna build them to be successful in the future, um, but to be confident children. So Lucia, excited to hear more from you here in just a bit. So thanks for being with us tonight. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started first. We're going to do a little segment with, um, with Dr. Patricia Arreras Romero. Romero. Um, we are so glad that you are here. She is the Chief Medical Officer at Jackson Behavioral Health Hospital. Um, I don't know when you sleep. I was reading your bio and all that you have done and are involved in, and I think when does this lady sleep? So you'll have to tell us your secret of when you get some rest. But she um, is the chief medical officer, but she's also responsible for managing the day-to-day -day clinical operations at Jackson Health, so the behavioral health center there. Um, she, Since she has been in that role, she's implemented so many things throughout the health system, all to help patient outcomes. She's very passionate about seeing that recovery and wellness is possible for all patients. So she pioneered the first medication assisted treatment clinic. She piloted a medical home model, um, among other things. And she has a passion truly for the severely mentally ill um, treatment with resistant depression and substance abuse disorder. So, but that's not all. <laughs> she is double board certified, um, a diplomat of the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology and a diplomat of the American Board of Preventative Medicine 
as a specialist in addiction medicine. I, I mean, I just don't know how you do it all. It's amazing. I think you probably have so much wisdom to offer us tonight and to share. And I feel certain if you have questions about anxiety or, or your mental health, I think she's going to help us out. So um, in addition, I thought this was very interesting reading your bio, but you were appointed to the Miami-Dade County Opioid Addiction Task Force. So I'm sure you have a lot of insight on just the current climate of Miami and whatnot. And she's also the current chairperson for the Addiction Advisory Board for Miami-Dade County. So um, she does work with the United Way. And I think obviously, in light of all of that and more, um, she has, has won numerous awards. The most recent, the Woman of Inspiration in 2019, well deserved, I think, um, as well as the Most Powerful Woman in Healthcare Award in 2017. So, wow, <laughs> Dr. Ares Romero, we're so glad you're here. Thank you, <laughs> thank you thank very you. much for being with us. Oh my goodness! Thank so, you. do you applause. sleep? Do you really sleep? I do. I have to sleep. I have to sleep and I have to meditate. You and have to. Yeah. And everything has to be on my calendar. So uh, I tell the kids, if it's not on my calendar, mm -hmm. it's not getting done. So they know it has wow. to be on my calendar. Yeah. And how many children do you have? They're four. But yeah. Oh my, but oh my but I space myself. I space myself. I have two older ones and two younger ones. Wow. I did too. Wow. Well, it's an honor. I was reading your bio and I was like, she's a national speaker and she's been on US News and World Report. She's been in the Herald, the Post, NBC News. And I'm like, and tonight she's going to be with Sierra Bragan of Miami Mom Collective. So you can add that to your resume. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Um, let's dive right in. You have so much to share. Um, so let's talk first just anxiety and how does anxiety manifest itself? particularly in children. Right, so it's, it's very difficult because um, with children, it's, diff it's, it's different than with adults, right? So um, it can manifest in many different ways. So with the little ones, you know, any stage that perhaps they had reached, they can kind of step back. So for instance, they might start sucking their thumb again, or if they were potty trained, and now they're having accidents, or maybe they start, start bedwetting. So those are some of the things, some of the clues. Um, tantrums, just, you know, they pass that tantrum stage, that, that terrible twos, terrible fours, right? Um, and so they start having a lot of tantrums. Um, as they get older, it could be more isolative behavior, even, even though you would think, well, but that's not really anxiety. But children tend to keep it inside, right? They don't want to tell people what they're afraid of most of the time. Um, GI upset, um, you'll find that they're having difficulty sleeping, perhaps they're not eating as much. Um, any changes in behavior that are just not normal for your child, um, we should be on alert. Just be alert when you see a change. So obviously that could manifest different for a five-year-old than it does for a preteen. Right, right. right. And, that, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing like, you know, with the kids, you know, they'll probably throw a tantrum, you know, on their way to school or when they have to do work, when perhaps before they would sit down for you and, and do their homework, right? Or, right. or, they'll, right. their, or they'll start throwing their toys. Or maybe right. um, they'll start clinging to you. So you'll find that they're really walking around the house and perhaps before you can leave them playing and now they're just holding on to you and then we'll leave you alone. Right. Right. So, wow. Yeah. Those type of changes. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw, you know, on the internet, a meme or something floating around that said, yeah, have you ever taken six online classes with bad internet, with you know, all these pressures and whatever. And it's like, yeah, your kid hasn't either. Like cut them some slack. You know, it was this reminder of like, oh my goodness, the things that, that they're dealing with that we have to remember, like, of course it's probably anxiety inducing that, what, that they're dealing Imagine, with. You know, you, you take a small child, now they can't have play dates. You know, right. it's hard for us that we can't socialize, right? And right. we, but we have Zoom, we can call our friends on the phone, but a little one is used to going to the park. You know, I, I have friends of mine that they lived in apartment buildings. The parks were closed. They couldn't go down to the common areas in, in their apartment buildings. What are they supposed to do with their kids? Um, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's challenging. So how do you explain that to a four-year-old, right? So right. those, yeah. those are stress and, and why mom? Why are we locked up in here, right? So it's really mm -hmm. difficult, it creates anxiety. And if we're anxious, you know, we transmit that to the child. Right. Well, that's a, that was kind of my next question. How can, like, what can parents do 
to prevent anxiety in their children? Is there anything that they can do to help them navigate if they are dealing with it? Yeah, so, so some of the, like with the older ones, you know, I, I always recommended, you know, try to limit the amount of TV time, social media time around the whole COVID thing, right? So, you know, stick to right. the facts, you know, we need to be educated and know what's happening, but we don't need to be constantly, you know, stimulated with all this information. It's, it, it doesn't do us any good. Um, another thing is really staying active. So, you know, doing different things as a family to stay active. For instance, what we started doing in my house is um, we would start working out at five o'clock all together. So, you know, we did kind of like this, you know, makeshift, you know, gym in, in the garage. And then we were, okay, everybody's going in the garage. We're all going to work out, you know, and doing that because it's very important for us to stay active. Nutrition is very important. So, you know, a lot of fruits and vegetables, making sure they're getting good nutrition, sleep. So, you know, a lot of the struggles that early on with a lot of my patients were that, you know, everybody's home. And so everybody's going to sleep at a different time. They're waking up whenever. So the routine, children love routine. They're going to tell you they hate it, but they truly need it in their lives. Oh, they need it. Oh, they need it. That's good. Yeah, it's very important. So you need to make sure that you wake up at the same time. You go to sleep at the same time, even if it's Saturday or Sunday. You know, so, so those are the kind of things that you can help because that lessens the anxiety. When things are predictable for children, it's so much easier. It's that uncertainty. And just think about us, right? This whole uncertainty yeah. was really, really terrible for us to deal with. So children are the same. Yeah. The hardest part, yeah, is just the unknown. It's and to think, unknown. oh my goodness, our little people who can't even process, it's like, we have to remember that. Along that vein, we did receive a question from a mom, or I'm assuming a mom, um, she said, how can we, how would you advise talking to our young children about COVID? She's got a five and an eight year old. So she's like, I don't know how much to tell them so that it doesn't create anxiety, but that also, you know, we're having a healthy conversation about it. So what, what would you advise parents? Well, I like that? to focus on the things that we do have in our control. So, um, I would limit to the facts. So, so there is, there is, depending on how old you, you will tear down the language, um, for them to understand. Um, so, so there's a, you know, there's a bug, there's a, you know, there's a disease depending on what, so the idea is that there's, there's an illness, right? Um, but right. You know, mom and dad or mom and mom, dad and dad, we're doing our best to keep us safe. And that's why we're spending time at home. That's why we're not going to the park. That's why I'm telling you to wash your hands. You know, don't be, you know, touching your face all the time. So those are the things that we can control to keep us safe. So the, I think the conversation should be around that. Um, and it's okay. That's it's okay to tell children. Yeah. And so, um, you know, and, and, you know, there's, there's books on it also. Um, actually, actually Jackson, the, the, um, the psychology department did one for our healthcare workers, which was great. Oh, great. And it really explained, um, you know, what the virus was with pictures. And it was really great for the little kids because what we found was that a lot of our nurses, uh, social workers, psychologists, all our staff were coming into work still. Right. And they're leaving little ones at home. And sometimes, you know, the little ones right. were like, no, we don't want you to leave. Why do you have to leave us here? Right. So this kind right. of a, it's like a coloring book. It's, it's a very short one, but it was, it was phenomenal and it was really great. So something like that would be good for, for them to have that conversation. That's good. I'm like Google Daniel Tiger or Sesame Street. There's bound to be something out there. <laughs> Um, but I love what you said, just choosing vocabulary that's appropriate for their age level and just opening up the dialogue, you know, and, and as it is appropriate. But um, what can we do as a parent to ensure, and you said, you know, like watch your anxiety so that it's not getting transferred, but how would you advise a parent to ensure that my anxiety doesn't cause my kid to have anxiety? So self-care is very important. And, and, you know, us as moms, we forget that a lot because we put everybody first, right? So our kids come first, you know, our, 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 our partner comes first, work comes next, you know, and then we're the last one standing. So we have to nurture ourselves and take care of ourselves in order for us to give everything that we do for our families. So self-care is very important. So things like stretching, yoga, meditation, mindfulness i'm huge on that i teach my patients that all the time and i know sometimes people have this idea of mindfulness like oh i have to sit on this mat yoga mat and cross my legs and you know go with a guru or something like that but in right. reality yeah but in reality it's not mindfulness is anything you can go for a walk and look at the trees 
and just count how many leaves or just look at the leaves or feel how your feet feel on the pavement or the smells mm -hmm. or the sounds. And that's mindfulness. And what happens, the beauty about that, and you're thinking, well, so what if I'm listening to the birds and I'm looking at, this, at the trees? Well, the truth is right. if you're in this moment, you can't have fear and you can't have anxiety. Yeah. Because anxiety only happens right. when we're thinking about the future, the what is. Mm. Okay. Exactly. So okay. those those are simple tips that we can just do. Breathing exercises are so important. So you can just Google, you know, YouTube. There's so much material out there, and just simple breathing exercises that, in fact, you can practice with your kids, even with the little ones, and they're fabulous. Um, and then always remember when you speak to your child, always try to have a lower tone, feel confident about what you're mm -hmm. saying. And if you notice that you're getting a little nervous, just take a breath and slow down your speech. Yeah. And that should That's help. That's good. I need to hear that uh, just for every day talking to my children, a good reminder. Take a breath. <laughs> Yeah. You know, you, know you, go, you go in the bathroom. I, I used to, I remember my kids were little, right? And I, the boys are 20 months apart. And I remember sometimes the only safe haven was the bathroom. Oh yeah. If you didn't get in there and lock the door before they get in there with you. <laughs> five minutes. I just need five minutes, right? Um, That's right. And another thing that, and I know it's challenging, you know, depending on the work schedule, I, I prefer to wake up early in the morning. And I tell a lot of my, my patients that, um, because just that time by yourself to kind of Definitely. think or be alone, have your tea, have your coffee before what I like to call all hell breaks loose at home is it's magical right. because it yeah, really it is that tone for the day. That's so true. That is, even just 15, 20 minutes before they're up. And that's right. 15 minutes. Oh, so, doctor's orders, everyone. <laughs> Get up early. Oh, that's good. Well, talk to us about the differences between like normal back to school jitters and like something more serious. Like if we notice behavioral changes in our kids, that could be signs that they have anxiety going back to school now. So anxiety is normal, right? So we, you know, and it's, it's kind of this, it's a defense mechanism of sorts, right? Because it keeps us away from fear. Anxiety actually makes us be productive. So if we have anxiety before an exam, that's good, right? Because then that makes you want to study for an exam. Study. Um, yeah, that's, 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 that's good. good. That, those are good things. That's a good reason why we have it. It's from our prehistoric you know, ancestors. But, um, but when it becomes pathological or it doesn't allow us to function, that's when it's bad. So, so kids are normally will have anxiety mm -hmm. before school. It always happens before COVID. So, you know, they're worried about their teacher. Are they going to have the same students? Are they going to have friends? Are they going to make the soccer team? So that's normal. And we talk about it. And, and you know, we always try to ask our kids, you know, um, you know, what is it that you're worried about? Or, or what is it that you fear? Mm -hmm. right? Or what is important to you this year? Right. So have that conversation with them. And then usually by four weeks, yeah. that anxiety should resolve. Um, if you, or if you notice okay, that four weeks, okay. usually four weeks, right. Cause they, they're starting to get into the routine. Okay. They get to know their teacher. They, they can right. understand what it's like and what to expect out of school or other teachers and things like that. The other thing is, it, unless mm -hmm. if you also see that it's very exaggerated. So now the child that used to want to go to school now is just kind of like clenching to the doorway saying, I'm not going. Or, right. or you start seeing symptoms, um, GI mm -hmm. symptoms are very common. So they'll have nausea, okay. they'll have vom they'll vomit, or okay. they will be going to the bathroom very frequently, or mommy, I have a headache. So those are some of the signs mm -hmm. you start worrying about. And, and if you see that it really continues and the behavior of the child has really changed, I would call my pediatrician right away. And um, okay. And just let them know, listen, this is what's going on, you know, with, with Cindy and I'm, I'm a little concerned and they can do a screening. Okay, that's good. And you said the pediatrician, because my next question was, at what point is my child's anxiety enough to seek medical attention and kind of what's the route? Like, pedi start with pediatrician, pediatrician or? Yeah, your pediatrician should know your child the best. Um, they've been seeing them, you know, ever since they're little baby babies, you know, you know, once a month and you know, so forth. And so they know them. And if you have a good relationship with your pediatrician, that would be my first call. Um, and they, they do a great screening. Um, you know, I had, I had um, somebody not too long ago um, that has a child that's adolescent. And, um, and he, he actually told her, he said, mom, you know what? I don't, 
I don't feel like my mental health is well, which was brilliant. I thought, my goodness, mm-hmm. how much insight this yeah. time, right? Well, the articulate. 13, yeah. right? 13. And so, well, you know, she took him to the pediatrician and the pediatrician evaluated him and did a screening and said, you know what, I think we need to go, he needs to talk to somebody at this point. So, so okay. the pediatrician well, does have the ability, if you see that, you know, that, you know, the pediatrician's not paying attention and you're still concerned, remember, you're the mom, you know your child best. So if you're, you're still concerned, right. there's something in your gut saying, hmm, this is not my child, I, then you, I, would, I would go yeah. ahead and get an um, appointment. That's great. I love what you said too about asking our children those questions and all of the questions were open-ended because I think sometimes we're like, are you scared? Are you nervous? Are you fearful? You know, like, yes, yeah, no, you know, but you had those open-ended questions of like, what's making you feel fearful? What's making you scared? You know, that's such a good reminder for and dialoguing with our children. The other thing that we, we sometimes um, don't do is that we'll tell them, no, but that's okay, but you're okay. Right. Right. You don't want to do that because of, of course the child's going to want to please you. And they're going to say, yeah, yeah, you're right, mom. I am okay. okay. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so Good. there's just kind of things, you know, kids tend to talk more when they're tired and they're going to go to bed. So that's why you always read about a, a bedtime routine because they're, they're worn out. Yeah. So when you sit with them during that time and talk to them, most of the time they are going to give you feedback. And yeah, that's when good. you pick them up from school, because now they just got, they got back from school, something might've happened and that might be a good opportunity for you to find out what's going on in school. Okay, that's good. Obviously kids and adults, we all have you know anxiety related to everyday sort of situations, but how has specifically the COVID pandemic heightened anxiety in kids and adults? Yeah, it's, I think it's been across the board and, and we've seen it even in our healthcare providers too, right? So. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, you know, it, it goes back to the uncertainty of the times, you know, all the misinformation right. we had at the beginning, we just didn't know, you know, we live here in South Florida, I know there's some people from other places, but you know, let's say the perfect example is a hurricane, right? So we get, there's an announcement of a hurricane, we all get prepared, we go, we go to Costco, we make that line, you know, we put up our shutter, mm-hmm. all this stuff, but we know there's an endpoint. Right. We know that we'll be right. hunkered down. Maybe a week, yep. maybe two without electricity, right? Um, That's right. If the whole graphic will just get past us, then we're done. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And then everything's opened up and yeah. you can go outside and take a nice deep breath. And, you know, but, but the problem with COVID is there's no end in sight. Yeah, and the unknown. It's happening. So it's that uncertainty, that sense of feeling out of control. And so I think mm-hmm. that's why it's been so hard on adults. And then on top of that, you worry about finances. What's going to happen with your, our economy? Am right. I going to lose my job? I had I had one of the moms right. that that we see. Um, you know, she kept telling me, you know, what if I lose my job? You know, what's going to happen? Um, you yeah. know, worry about the kids at school. Worry about the kids at home. If we have an, you know, an elder, you know, we're that sandwich generation where we might have parents a little bit older and they might be sick. What if I bring something home to my parents? I, you know, not being able to see your parents yeah. or yeah. see your your siblings. So. A lot of it, and that, as much as we don't want to transmit it to our kids, we do. You know, remember, you know, if you remember yeah. when your kids yeah. were little, you, see, you mentioned that you have little ones, right? So my perfect example of how we I transmit do. Yeah. kids. Yeah. So, so you remember when your child starts to learn to walk and they fall, right? And what do they do? Yeah. They're yeah. quiet and they look at you. And what are they waiting? They're waiting for yeah, like, what? Do I cry? Do I laugh? What? And I'm like, good job. You did it. Stand up. It's okay. <laughs> But if you say, yeah. oh my goodness, what happens? The child starts crying. Right. Right. That's right. So, right. Yeah. so they're always looking for, for clues to see how to respond. So that's why it's important yeah. to it's take care of yourselves. Yeah. yeah. And, and check in and do what, what we can do that makes us happy and makes us calm. And it could be just, you know, sitting in the car, turning on the radio and listening to the soundtrack of Hamilton if that makes you happy, right? But you need those yes. times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you need those moments to just really, yeah. you know, reconnect with yourself and just calm yourself. And then you're able to, to be better for your child. Yeah. Oh, that's good, doctor. That's really good. Um, Two-part question. So we've talked about, you know, kids who are going to school and they're having anxiety about that going back. But also, you know, there's a lot of families who are still choosing to stay home home and to do school at home or you know the schools are doing that so what would you say like what 
and you spoke a little bit to this, but like what can parents do to manage their personal stress when everybody's home? But then also we received a question from a mom. Um, what about like when they're seeing like their child is not having any motivation now that they're into this homeschool situation, there's a lot there, you know, their social interaction is so decreased. Like what would you suggest for that? I know it's, it's so challenging, you know, and everybody's home and, um, and, you know, and, and it's hard for everybody to be on track. Right. So I think one of the things is, is flexibility. I think that, um, we all have these ideas of how things should run and how things should, should be. And sometimes we have to step back and mm -hmm. say, you know what, maybe this isn't working right now. So let's see what we can do to make it work better. Um, you know, what I found is definitely having a routine and again, depending on, you know, how old the child is, um, you know, when kids start kindergarten, pre-K, you know, they have this beautiful board and with a border and the teacher writes, you know, from eight o'clock to eight 15, we're going to do this and whatever. So really having that predictable, you know, the pattern for the child is very important. Um, making sure that they do get up in the morning and do the whole grooming, um, take, take off their pajamas, put on the regular yep. clothes, wash their face, because that changes your mindset. It gets you ready, right? It's not the same when we do a Zoom call. Call if I'm in my pajamas, I'm not gonna be paying attention. If I'm doing it in bed, I'm in a different, you know, mental frame. Yeah. So we mentioned kids. So okay. try to do that. Okay. Depending how old the child is, have the child stand up. Let's stretch. You know, let's take a break. Why don't we, yeah. you know, see who can, you know, who can dance the longest and put some music on. Or, you know, let's go outside, let's do a hula hoop, because they do need to be physical, they do need to move. Um, you can also plan right. a party on Zoom for, for some of their friends, so instead of a physical play date, yeah, yeah, you can do that. Um, it's not the best, you know, but I know one of my, my son's friends, they did a, a video party um, through Zoom for his okay. birthday, like in, you know, whatever it was, June. So, right. But we have to be a little bit creative. It's 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 very challenging, you know, um, for all of us, including the children. So I would say that um, keep motivated. You know, we we've, we've reinvented the board game now, so we, we've actually been playing board games, which is kind of cool. I love it, right? Yeah, yeah. Kind of cool. we, we actually board games are coming back. I love yeah. it. <laughs> we played Monopoly, you know, uh, for like three days in a row because my son would refuse to lose, so we had to keep playing. But so I things like. That exercising together, going for walks, you know, bike riding. I had never met so many neighbors like I did during COVID. Um, yes, so there's so much silver lining in this. If we can just have the eyes to see it, you know, and, and probably that's even a tactic, you know, we're talking about mindfulness, but a tactic to help our own anxiety kind of stay at bay is like, goodness, what if I just kept a list of all the things that have been silver Good. linings or gratitude so, things gratitude, right you know? so actually the research shows um that if you keep a gratitude journal you know it causes you know improving your happiness and your longevity actually your health improves wow. with wow. Having gratitude journals so that's something you can do every morning yeah you just that's write three things that you're thankful for it's it's, it's a five minute gratitude um, so That's those so things help. Yeah. 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 And such a good discipline to teach our children, you know, even at a young age to yeah. be great. Yeah. Those That's are good. Great. You can breathe. Like, you, you know, you can tell your kids, you know, I know you're upset right now, but why don't you breathe the right. mom? Right. Let's, let's take a deep breath. You know, and I, I like using the balloon. I don't know if you've ever heard of the balloon. So you just tell the child to inflate like a balloon and you count one, two, three, four. Okay. Now we're going to deflate it. One, two, three, four. And then you make them do it like two or three times and it's fun. And they're moving their bodies and they're learning to breathe great. and take control, right, of their emotions. Yeah. That's good. Wow. Life skills, teaching them. <laughs> these are skills they'll need for life, That's you know. Really I'm like, if I needed at 35 years old, probably <laughs> my kid's going to use it in the future, you know. Um, so good. Okay. Talk to us quickly. Um, just a couple more questions for you. I'm going to rapid fire a few of them. But for parents who've decided to continue to continue virtual learning at home, how can they explain these decisions to maybe their older children who are aware more so of like the pandemic, but still without causing them fear and anxiety? Right, so I think a good thing, especially with the older ones, um, you, can, you can really have a conversation where you say, you know, I'm still a little concerned about um, the way they've implemented going back to school. Um, so I, I'd rather wait. Right till things change. And you can use whatever example. And you can also say, well, you know, we have grandpa 
that we still go to visit and we don't want grandpa to get right. sick. So examples of the reason why, because you know, they're older, so they should be able to understand. Um, you know, you avoid that, I, I'm afraid I'm gonna die or I think terrible things are gonna happen, but just, you know, real, the facts, right. just really ana analyze the facts. Um, and so, and again, always focus on the things that we're in control of, you know, and then so I, that's the reason why we're staying home because I know here, you know, you have, you know, the hand sanitizer and you're able to wash your hands and, you know, so forth and so on. That's good. That's good. Focusing on the things you can control. I'm like, I feel like that's the nugget that I could take that and I can remember that. That's so good. Um, what about any tools that we can give our children or ways we can prepare them to navigate new situations that might cause them anxiety? Maybe COVID related, maybe not, but giving them good tool. I mean, you've talked about the breathing. We've talked about gratitude. We've talked about helping them understand the things they can and can't control, having dialogue, what kind of other things would you suggest? So the only way we can deal with our emotions is if we were able to name them. So learning how to name hmm. your emotion is a great thing to learn when you're young. Um, because as you get older, yeah. we're always gonna have issues, right? There's always gonna be things that are gonna happen. Things are gonna make us sad, happy, upset, um, frustrated. Yeah. So I think learning how, so, you know, so, Johnny, you know, I know that you were upset because I said we had to go home. You know, how did you feel? Right. And have them label that. Right. Right. That's because, good. yeah, that's because good. Truth, emotions don't last forever. And that's the other thing. So if somebody's right. really mad for a long time, you say, well, you know, you know, Johnny, I understand you're upset. What can we do next time? And learn, they need to learn how to problem solve. We're there to right. guide them, but they need to learn how to problem solve. Right. What can we do next That's time right. so you don't get whatever word they used? So you don't get angry. Yeah. You don't get mad. Mm, that's good. Oh, we're going to get deeper into this when we talk with um, Yanni and Lucia. But man, so I mean, there are adults who don't know how to name their emotions or struggle. Yeah. You know, I mean, I struggle too at times, but it's so key and important because like you said, it's like we can deal with it. We can put it on the table when we can call it what it is. So that's good to remember with our children. Okay, one more for you. Um, and we've got a couple other that have come from our, um, from our audience. So I want to try to get to those. But what kid-appropriate outlets, activities should we be aware of so that our child can properly let out their anxiety? She talked about hula hooping, getting outside, you know, taking a walk. But are there any other activities or outlets you would suggest? So, again, the age. Um, they can do drawing. So we can have them draw. That's a great avenue. Journaling. Um, another good thing uh -huh. that, that works is, is having some kind of purpose. So you can maybe do a project, something that's meaningful. Um, so maybe you can start planning a garden, yeah. maybe like a small garden, or maybe you guys can, you know, decide to do different things that perhaps you hadn't done. You know, you can maybe do little paintings, you know, for the house or you know, different things like that, like a project, because then that focuses your energy and something positive. Yeah. And something positive as opposed to, worrying or being concerned that's right and you're being productive you're going to come out with something a project you come out with a garden that's awesome and after that there's something to be proud of this is what we did yeah. together that's right there's a reason all those adult coloring books are selling like hotcakes you know i'm like there's something to that like when i sit down and color with my daughter i'm like I feel like I just had a therapy session and I just colored. <laughs> but you can relax. Yeah. And you're constantly awesome. on, the, on the drawing or the painting or the coloring. So you can't think of other things, right? That's you're right. focused on what you're doing. Yeah. Oh, that is good. Wow. Um, Dr. Arras and Ramirez, we could, we could keep going all night because this is great stuff and this is really your wheelhouse. We appreciate you so much. I want to jump, um, just one question that we got from our audience about, and you spoke to this about doing, um, you know, a virtual play date or some kind of gathering for social, like, if kids are doing virtual school, this, this mom wants to know, like, should we try to do like a play date every now and then with just maybe one other family so that kids kind of feel like they're getting that in person, you know, to help so reduce the anxiety you're on your comfort level. Um, and, and the family and also making sure that the other family hasn't really been exposed and hasn't been like, you know, going to, you know, parks or whatever. But I think if it's a small group and, you know, you, you maintain the hygiene and, you know, make sure you wear your mask and, you know, cleaning your hands and, you know, distance. Yeah. It, it really depends yeah. on the comfort level of the family. Yeah. That's yeah, good. we want them. We want them off the technology, and it's just like, my goodness, yes, here we that's are, right? Hard. 
Well, that's it's another question that we had that we're going to get to here with um, Lucia and Yanier, but it's like, okay, we're trying to motivate her. Like, how can we get game night happening in her house when all they want to do is watch a movie or be on the devices, you know? And I think it's just, I'm not the parenting expert, so I'm going to let um, Yanni and Lucia take this no, one, but I'm no. like, I think maybe we just have some brain-free time, you know, like we're putting the iPads away. But um, wow, thank you so much, um, Dr. Arrest Ramirez. We're very, very grateful that you're with us tonight. Um, wonderful information. Again, she is the Chief Medical Officer at Jackson Behavioral Health, so doing so many great things in our community, and we appreciate that, and just Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us tonight. We're, we're very grateful. So um, I want to transition now. Okay, Yanni and Lucia, we need your parenting expert <laughs> advice um, in terms of how we're dealing with raising resilient children. So I think that's something I have a, a child development background and I'm like, if I remember anything from school, I remember the importance of raising resilient children and resiliency, how important that is. Um, but you know, on the day to day, it's like, how do we <laughs> play that out? So I'd love it if one of you would talk to us about what does it mean for our children to be emotionally resilient? So I'll go ahead and answer that. Thank you. Um, I think it's important to encourage oh. resilience. We kind of have to know, first of all, what it means, right? So this means the ability to recognize, understand, and accept feelings, not only in themselves, but in others like parents, right? And moms to be able to express their feelings in appropriate ways that, you know, don't harm others as well. It's also all about being able to face and resolve difficult situations. And we are in a very difficult situation now, right? It's kind of in a funky time being and living in a pandemic. And it's also being able to cope with stressful and upsetting situations, right? So it's a little bit of all of that focus into, you know, what it means to be emotionally resilient. Right. And we've all had the child who's had the meltdown <laughs> and you think, how can I help you just be resilient right now? <laughs> Which maybe right then in that moment is not the, the opportunity, you know, it's things that you're building. But um, I'll ask Yanni this, like Yanni, tell us what are the benefits? Obviously there's a ton of benefits for children to be emotionally resilient. Yes. Uh, thank you for having me. It's important to start teaching this early on to our children. Yeah. Emotionally resilient children are more likely to be caring, more so have yeah. those social skills that are so important, especially right now through the isolation that we are all living. They learn yeah. to be more empathic and to be more sensitive to the needs of others, not only about themselves. Also, they're able they learn to manage their feelings more appropriately in a way that helps themselves get feel better again. Also, they yeah. learn coping skills, way to manage those situations, those emotions more appropriately, in, such as they, they don't use so much avoiding or denying the, the situation or the problem or relying so much on other people to fix the problem or give them that attention that they so many times are looking. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. That's so good. We want to equip them so that they can be independent to, to manage these things. I love that you said that because I have little ones, but I even think, you know, my three-year-old I'm not going to expect her to manage all that she's feeling with COVID right now, you know, but it's like, I can teach her when her brother takes a toy from her, how to like be resilient with her emotion in that moment, you know, and we like can baby step onto that. So that's such a good reminder of these building blocks that we're giving our children and being emotionally resilient. Um, Dr. Araz Romero was talking about feelings and I thought, man, we could really camp out here for a while. Um, but let's talk about what are the steps that we can take to talk about feelings, to help our children talk about their feelings, well, what would you advise? I think the first step, and it's very important, it's to accept that, you know, it's normal and it's healthy to have ups and downs, right? We as adults have ups and downs. We have some pretty bad days and some pretty good days and children are the same, right? Letting them know that it is okay to have these different feelings and to show them and to express them. Um, yeah. so going through this time of transition, your child might be feeling a little bit more down than pre-COVID times. But it's also important that when you talk about feelings that you do so in a way that your child understands, right? Using the wording and the language that they know what it means, right? So it's also being able to potentially just talk about it in your everyday conversation, um, talking about emotions and how you recognize it as a parent because 
as we know, you know, our children soak in so much information just by watching adults and watching their parents. But I think it's also very important, and this is something that we've discussed um, in our webinars as well, you have to be emotionally expressive yourself as a parent, because if your child isn't seeing you talk about your emotions, you're hearing you talk, oh, I feel happy today, or I'm happy, or I'm sad, they're not going to maybe feel as comfortable to talk about their own feelings, right? So it's giving them the opportunity and knowing that you also go through some good days and bad days. And then yeah. it's labeling the emotions for them, like um, Dr. Ades Romero said, you know, it's saying something like, it sounds like you're getting frustrated with the Zoom today. Is there anything yeah. and then giving them the opportunity to talk about it? But, you know, saying yeah. that word so they know, okay, what I'm feeling right now is frustration. This is right. Not that's good wow and it's amazing when um you know i always say our kids are mirrors sometimes we see ourselves in like their struggles you know um how about this my three-year-old today i was on the phone or something and i was i get i get riled up right and so i'm talking like all excited and my three-year-old goes mommy it sounds like you feel upset <laughs> and i thought oh my goodness that's my three-year-old calling me out on it you know but it's so true but having that dialogue with our children where it's a safe place to talk about how we're feeling to call the feelings where they are um I, that's great and, and i have a question from one of our audience members a single mom and she's maybe this is something that kind of goes along with this but she's trying to motivate her kids into doing more like board games outdoor activities but like they don't feel like they want to do that. They want to play video games and they want to, you know, so I think, I mean, there obviously are some feelings related there, but like, how would you advise her to encourage them in that? Do you have a, like a strategy maybe for that? I think one that Yanni and myself, um, we tend to say is using a when and then statement, right? So when we're done with our walk, we can go ahead and play some video games, but it's knowing they have to do or have this activity as a family completed before they can go and do the video games or the virtual hangouts that they would like, right? I think when and then is a great thing because it's like saying you have to do this and then that fun time. Okay, that's good. When and then. That's a little. That one is actually really effective when the then, that thing that comes after, is something that really motivates your child. Something okay. that you really want to look forward to, allows them to be more engaged and actually yeah. be more in. in involved in the process. Oh, that's good. I think I um, subconsciously motivate myself it's like that sometimes. I'm like, okay, you can, you know, whatever, go do whatever when you finish that project that you keep putting off, you know, so that's good. We do it with ourselves, but that's a good reminder when and then with our kids. So love that. Great advice. Um, okay. Talk to us about what age should we start teaching our children about their emotions? Is there kind of like a developmental milestone that, okay, now it's time to start talking about this. Yeah, I think it's important to keep in mind that it's never too early to start. Of course, yeah. it's going to look different when your child is younger and they're learning, they don't really have the vocabulary to express themselves as much. But it's never too early to start helping them identify those emotions, what is happening, what's, what is happening, like Lucia and Dr. Um, Ares mentioned, giving them the vocabulary so they can express themselves. Many times parents feel frustrated when they're right. dealing with a situation with their child. And the child is, is crying or screaming. They're not really verbalizing what it, they're feeling. It's sometimes they don't have, they don't know how to describe it. So as a parent describing how you see they're behaving, if they feel, look tense and they're red, it looks like you're angry. I feel that identifying what is, how does it feel when you're angry? So it's uh, helping your child to recognize about that feeling, to talk about it in a, in a way that they feel comfortable at their level. It's really important to meet them at their level where your child understands and knows. And as your child grows, uh, they, they, they progress, they start learning new things, new vocabulary, they start experiencing new, new things, they also learn how to manage those feelings more appropriately and how to express them in a more effective way. That's good. That's great. What, what should we do when upset feelings turn into hurtful behaviors? So yeah, that's a great question because um, many times, especially now, there's probably an increase in misbehavior um, given that we're spending time at home, they're more bottled up, they're anxious and worried. Um, something that we stress throughout um, here at the Parent Club is definitely being consistent when implementing discipline, right? You're not going to be noticing too much of a change in your child's 
behavior if you provide a consequence today and one next week, right? So it's important to keep that in mind always. Right. Before yeah. providing a discipline or a consequence, you want to acknowledge those upset feelings, right? Before you handle that problem behavior, because what they're feeling is valid, right? This is a term that we, we hear, it's valid. They're, they might be upset, they might be um, angry, but okay, let's recognize that, honey, I understand that you're, you're upset that you've been on the computer all day, but you want to acknowledge that first and then tell them what to stop doing, but explain to them why and not just leave it up in the air. So it's like, but you have to stay on the computer because this is school, you know, this is important for your education and you can lose, you know, your spot in the class or you might not be able to concentrate or have all the information for the test. Mm -hmm. And what I want you to do, so give them an opportunity to, you know, release that emotion. I want you to take a two minute break, you know, wash your face and then come back onto the computer. And then that can help. Right. Okay. That process yeah. is step. So then it's like, okay, mom understands that I'm upset, but I she's telling me why I should stay on the computer. So it's important. And then right. Just, yeah. That's good. Just the dialogue piece of like, I think sometimes we just kind of zoom past it and we're like, you know, what Dr. Rivera was saying was like, it's okay, you're okay, or it's fine, or let it go, or just don't worry about it, you know, instead of engaging with them and talking it through and like learning with them and leading them through it. I think that's a thread that I'm seeing and what you're all sharing, which I love. Tell us, um, what do we do when our child is frustrated or stuck on something? Because I know sometimes it's like, you're stuck. I'm stuck with how to get you unstuck. <laughs> so what should we do when they're stuck or frustrated? Yes. And something that I'm going to say that I know most likely you guys have heard a ton of times is modeling behavior. You know, it's per we repeat it so much because it's so important. How do you manage and how do you behave as a parent when you're dealing with a stressful situation, with a difficult situation, especially when you're dealing with your child's problems or, or difficulties, maybe with virtual learning. So maintaining yourself calm, you know, talking to your child about what they can find to solve that problem. You yourself helping your child in that process. Many times as a parent also is taking it a, a, a step back and putting yourself on a break. I know automatically many parents want to solve the, the problem for your child immediately and make it all feel better. But give your child some space for them, for they themselves to problem solve with the situation see how they can find a solution if after a while they can't you can assist them in the process not solve the problem for, for them solve the problem yeah. with them that way they can right. learn what to do in the future when they have a similar situation right. oh that's good i need to hear that because sometimes it's easy to i'm like let me just rescue you from whatever it is but that's part of build, building resilience it's like they need to struggle with it and they need to learn to problem solve so well, sometimes it's easier also for the same parents let me just do it for them right away so we can get on yes that's right oh yanni that's good okay what about lucia tell us what can we do to encourage our children to express emotion so it's something, it could be many different things, but it's also maybe seeing what your child's interests are. Maybe it's through books or through fantasy or drama. Maybe they love to act and they're able to express their emotions like so. Or maybe it's drawing, maybe it's in the arts of some sort, or maybe through music also, right? Maybe they're having a tough day and they play, you know, more of a calming um, song or anything like that. It's just trying to find a way also what their interests are and seeing how that can be incorporated to expressing themselves. But it's also important to keep in mind that children do become more aware of those emotions when expressiveness is valued, right? So it's also you yourself, like Yanni just mentioned, you wanna model the behavior you ultimately wanna see in your children. So if you're not being emotionally expressive yourself, it's gonna be a little more difficult for your child to feel comfortable in expressing their emotions in whichever way they would prefer to, obviously in a safe manner. Right, a safe and healthy way. Oh, that's good. What about, um, Yanni, talk to us about praising our children. Now, is there an appropriate way to do this? Yeah, and, and I love that many, sometimes we feel, should I praise all the time? But the idea is many of our children constantly receive negative feedback. Even as a parent, many times when you pick up your child from school, from daycare, it's like, your child didn't complete this, this is what went wrong. But that day is long. There are many hours in minutes in a day. And your child is not misbe misbehaving 100% of the time. The whole time, there, yeah. There are many two moments where they did well or they put in effort. 
So as a parent, let's praise that effort, those achievements. You know, when your child follows a routine, follows a schedule, when he's, uh, your child opens that computer ready for the virtual learning on time, praise that. And be what we call, <laughs> yes. And be what, we, not only uh, with your hand and gestures, but be what we call descriptive praise. Be very specific at what, what you praise, the way your child has a specific idea what is they doing right, so they can repeat that more and more. For example, you call your child to sit on the table for dinner and they come right away. Say, I love it how you came to, uh, to, to the table as soon as I call you. So you're being very specific. At the beginning where you're using those uh, uh, descriptive phrase, your child may look at you a little weird. Why are you yeah. talking like that? Especially if you've never done it before. But yeah, you know, right. do it in your day, your day your life that can help a lot your child to uh, follow those instructions and, and have an easier way in dealing with these different situations. Yeah, that's good. Praise what you want to raise. This is what I've heard. <laughs> that's great. Um, what about Lucia? Tell me what is the best way to respond when our child shares their feelings with us? Like, I got to think I want to affirm that so that they'll continue to do that. Right. I think the first thing is, you know, stopping what you're doing right when and being able to listen to when your child is explaining to you or if you know you're working from home and your child decides to talk to you say honey give me five minutes and i'm going to be all ears so it's not like saying no i don't have time now it's giving a little pause and then right. saying all ears later um but once yeah. they describe their emotions their feelings or their experiences it's important that you summarize what your child has told you something as simple as like okay. I'm really disappointed that you weren't able to talk to your friend today because she was busy, right? I, it's, you know, not adding to what they've told you. And it's also very important to not tell them how they should be feeling, right? If they say, I'm worried, I'm, I'm anxious, it's important not to say you shouldn't be feeling that way, right? Because then they might say, okay, mm -hmm. what I'm feeling is bad. And feeling is valid. Yeah. Wow. So it's That's good. Making sure that, you know, instead of doing that, you acknowledge their feelings, right? I can see why that would make you yeah. feel. I can see why you're so anxious about school, right? It's being there. And even if you don't technically really understand why they're feeling that way, you want to show them and re, um, make sure that they, you know, it's like mom is hearing me. Mom is listening to me and, and cares. Yeah. About me, right? That's good. That's good. Yeah, to be a safe place, we want them to be able to, when they're finally expressing, to be affirmed that it's a good thing to express that in a safe way, like you said. Um, okay, I think this is an important thing. We obviously want our children to understand their own feelings, um, but empathy is huge. You know, we want to raise children who are empathetic to other children. So, how can we help our children recognize feelings in others? Yeah, and that's something that we really want to teach our children because it's really important for them when it comes to how they interact with other children as well other people yeah. learning how to manage those situations. So uh, with children, we want to maybe use books, movies that they like, TV shows, use those characters that they like and the events that they see, whether not only happy events, but you know, events where they, those characters have something that is difficult or upsetting. Learn, um, guide your ch children to identify the emotions those uh, characters are feeling what they could do mm -hmm. if they felt that in a moment, what, what are some ways that they can manage the situation or make it like a fun type of game too, you know? Oh, look what happened to yeah. the character. What would you do if that happened to you? If you were a superhero, yeah. what do you think a superhero will do in that moment? So to, learn, right. just, to identify those feelings. As parents too, you know, be emotionally expressive, you know, give them tips to your child what type of face is like when you're angry and you make it with right. them. How do you identify yeah. when someone's angry needs a little moment before you start playing or talking to them? So they in practice that in today, day to day, day life with their fears, siblings, at home with the parents, that way they can learn this little by little. That's good. Okay, that's one question that we received. So let's let's camp there for just a second. I'm watching our time too. We're gonna keep it under maybe five minutes. We're um, we're almost done. So thanks everyone for hanging in with us. But sibling rivalry, one attendee is saying, has been crazy at her house. Any tips for how to help with that? Yes, uh, I, I and mean, that's a question that we have a lot. You know, creating that structure is really important. Like. Dr. Ares has uh, mentioned many times, children thrive when they live in a predictable environment. You know, right. and 
Also keeping in mind some type of sibling rivalry and arguments and conflicts is normal. It's part of growing up. It's part of, you know, for, uh, for, uh, the child, your, how you shall interact with one another. So creating certain rules and expectations right. of what they need to follow. Being consistent with the discipline also, yeah. you know, and, and being fair with both the children. If they have different ages, you know, having different expectations of the things that they can do and follow. And also as a parent, modeling that behavior, how to interact with one another. How do you respond when your child is doing, having doing that interaction is really important. Because also if you get agitated mm -hmm. in the moment, most likely your child will, children will get agitated too, and it will escalate that, that type of situation. And I think to add on to what Yanni said, it's also yeah. important that when they are playing well, Right, be descriptive in the praise. So praise. when good. And they're not hurting one another, tell them, I love how well you're playing with one another. another. I'm so proud of you. So then your child is going to start to learn, okay, this is the way that mom or dad wants us to, you know, play well. And then provide a consequence when they don't play well. So they're going to be learning, okay, this, I don't like going into timeout or quiet time. Let me go back to yeah. getting from, from mom or dad. Good. Yeah. Oh, it's so easy sometimes to just be stressed by it and be like, stop fighting, <laughs> you know, instead of like, okay, let's drill down into what is happening. So that's a, that's a good reminder. Um, Lucia, talk to us. We're going to wrap it up here. Two more questions, but how, or maybe not how, but what are some coping strategies that could help our children with stress and anxiety? What would be kind of like your, leave us with your, your wisdom on that? Um, I think to, before I do that, it's always important that this is great because you get to model how you cope with your stress and anxiety. So that's something that if your child sees you reading a book when, you know, you're anxious, like, oh, mom is reading this book. Maybe I can do that as well. So you're relaxing and then they're also learning how they can maybe handle their stress and anxiety. But some basic um, things might be problem solving, right? Encouraging your child to work at solving their own problems because they might be thinking, I can't do it. I don't know how to do it on my own, but it's giving them that guidance so that it doesn't stress them out in the future and they already know the steps to follow. Very important is positive self -talk. Talking back to those negative thoughts that we have. And it's all these things, all these coping skills that we mentioned, that your child isn't gonna learn it just like that. You need to model that, right? Um, relaxation, um, right? Physically, you know, taking those slow and deep breaths, like Dr. Aris um, Romero said about the balloon is a great example. Relaxation of their muscles. And these two um, relaxation strategies are great because you can do it anywhere, anytime. Before presentation, they can take deep breaths. Um, before logging on to Zoom, they can take deep breaths. And it's also something as simple as maybe listening to relaxing and calming music or their music of choice, right? Maybe many kids at six or seven years old yeah. don't really like Mozart, but it's seeing what type of music um, relaxes them. And finally, asking for help or support. You know, also as a parent checking in, and if you've noticed, yeah. you know, anxiety is impeding their ability to do certain things, that's where, you know, you want to step in and see, maybe we need to seek professional support or advice because this is not just something I can do as a parent. That's good. That's great. Um, and Yanni, I'll throw it to you just to, to get your final thoughts too of like, what can we do to help our child cope with stress and change, yeah. you know, in daily life? Because this is, it's not, not just a COVID thing, right? <laughs> stress and change is always going to happen. So no, definitely. And it's something that is also learned, teaching your child to normalize certain moments of anxiety and nervousness. Like we mentioned before, Many times it can be helpful. It can motivate you to do better in school. It can be some, uh, like an alert system when you're in a situation of danger. For you know, as a parent also modeling, what is that you I do when I'm nervous or I'm stressed? What are the things that help me calm down? Maybe you can teach those to your child. Like the breathing is a great one. Most of relaxation exercises, I love those because it's basically like a little activity that you do with your child. Like pressing your, your fist really, really tight and counting to four and then let it open. It's a great way to teach a child to differentiate when you're tense. It's when how your face is, is closed. When you open it, you see how it feels. That's when you relax and being present in the moment. So in a way, it's also helping them ground themselves in the moment and be more aware. 
Good. I love that. And I love that. Those are things that you can do in like Lucia was saying, you do that anywhere, anytime. It's always in your pocket. You can always pull your hand out and always be breathing. So, so great. Wow. Yanni, Lucia, and Dr. Iris Romero, we are so thankful to have you tonight to be able to talk about this important topic. Um, man, we could keep going, but I think we've, you've given us lots of great things to chew on, to think on. Um, audience, thank you for joining us tonight. I do want to draw to your attention um, a couple things you may or may not be aware of, but the U Health Jackson Children's Care, the pediatric emergency rooms at Holtz Children's Hospital and Jackson North are actually open 24 7. So most people don't realize that. They think, Oh my goodness, it's the middle of the night. Where in the world do I go? But these emergency rooms are open 24 seven. And not only that, but they're all staffed with board certified pediatric emergency medicine specialists. So parents and kids are getting access to every pediatric subspecialist at the, the Holtz Children's Hospital from the University of Miami Health System and Jackson Health. So there's just a wealth of resource there. So Heaven forbid anyone need the ER, but if you do, um, just a little plug about that. It's just, you're going to get the best care. Um, and then the Holtz Children's Hospital actually offers 24-hour kids-only emergency rooms. So especially in this season, if you're a little bit nervous, you know, if you got to take your kid to the emergency room, you don't want to go to just anywhere, um, that's a kids-only emergency room there. So, and then the, the doctors and the nurses are also certified in pediatric advanced life support. So, you're just going to get the best care. Um, but I hope you enjoyed tonight's series. We're going to continue. So go ahead and mark your calendars because in two weeks, we're going to be back Thursday, October 29th, 8 p.m., same time, same place. Um, we're going to be talking about what about COVID and flu season. So this is something we kind of alluded to in one of our previous webinars. One of the doctors with us said, you know, we don't have a lot of research really of COVID and flu, so, but here we are, we're coming and flu season has arrived and now is the time for us to plan how we're gonna protect ourselves, our families from a serious and highly contagious illness. Like other illnesses haven't gone away in light of COVID. So with flu season, we're gonna learn about basic flu facts. Um, Dr. Barry Gelman is gonna be with us. Um, and then also, um, it's just a reminder that flu can be very life-threatening. So we're going to have fellow Miami mom, Judith Ferrer, um, will be speaking about how she found this out firsthand when actually um, her six-year-old daughter, Victoria, was in critical care because of um, a bout with the flu. So, you know, we kind of don't, we kind of think, oh, flu, I'll get the sniffles, you know, but but it can have serious implications. And so we're going to talk more about that. It's two weeks from now, 8 p.m. Thursday, October 29th. So set your calendars um, and you can actually go ahead and register at jacksonevents.org. So I believe we've done probably close to 10 of these now. So if you've missed any amazing topics that we've um, already covered, many more amazing ones coming, but you can access all of these videos anytime, jacksonevents.org. So there's downloadable tips, resources. You can find it all there. So um, thank you again to all of you who joined us. Thank you so much, Yanni, Lucia, and Dr. Arez Rivera. We are very grateful. Um, here's some great information for you guys to follow along, get more resources. Um, if Miami Mom Collective can serve any of you, we're also here to help you. We're miamimomcollective.com. And we hope to see you in two weeks when we talk about COVID and flu. So. We'll see you back then at eight o'clock. Thank you so much for joining us.